welcome to our YouTube channel. My name is Neil. And my name is Brett. And we have a really, really exciting message from Angus Bucken, especially for NCCD. So make sure that you like, subscribe, and share this with as many friends as you know.
belong to you I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you
morning. I'm Paul Hannington, and together with my wife Judy, we're care pastors here at NCZB. I just want to start by reminding us that tithing and giving are a huge part of God's economy, and therefore we need to work out our walk with God as we tithe and give. Allow me to read from the passion, the response of the poor widow in Mark 12, 41 to 44, reading from the Passion Version. And then he sat down near the offering box, watching all the people dropping in their coins. Many of the rich would put in large sums of money. But a destitute widow walked up and dropped in two small copper coins, and less, worth less than a penny. Jesus called his disciples to gather around and then said to them, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given a larger offering than any of the wealthy. For the rich only gave out of their surplus, but she sacrificed out of her poverty and gave to God all that she had to live on, which was everything she had. As we see Jesus' response, we can infer that we need to continue giving. If Jesus had wanted us under grace to not tithe and give, he would have told them that at that point. Remember, we glorify God when we give. The value of her gift was not measured by the amount that she gave, but by the spirit in which she had given it. Remember that when you give, you give gifts any size to God. You give it with the right spirit. It pleases God. Let's give joyfully. Let's give generously. May you be blessed in your giving. Today we have the privilege of having a message specially done for us for NCCB by Angus Buckham. Sit back and enjoy the message. I greet you in Jesus' precious name from Shalom Farm in KZN. Ashley Bell, my dear friend, I want to thank you so much for the way in which you have stood with us for many years. I've just been talking to the camera crew about the sacred assembly and you had so much to do with that, you and your congregation. I was sharing with a young evangelist who's sitting right here now and he's listening to this program and uh, he's a real Timothy to me, also a spiritual son. And I was telling him about the incident that happened in your church. If you remember the time I came and shared the gospel, we made the altar call and that young man came forward. Do you remember? And he collapsed. And uh, right at the altar call, very inconvenient for me. <laughs> and uh, we went down and prayed for him and God raised him up. Do you remember that? That was amazing. So thank you for <clears throat> who you are. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you also to your congregation, Ash. You know, you've been with me not just in the good times, but also in the other times as well. And it happens with uh, the work that we do, doesn't it? One day you're a champion, the next day you're, you're absolute, uh, absolute waster. But God knows our heart. And so it gives me great pleasure to share the news, the good news with you and your congregation. Thank you so much. And we're going to speak today about the simple life. You know, the Lord Jesus himself is our ultimate example on how we're supposed to live. Isn't that right? He says, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The Lord Jesus left his throne in glory to come down to earth in the form of a most defenseless baby. He didn't come down as a great warrior. He wasn't born in um, Rome, in Caesar's palace. No, 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 no. He wasn't born in Pharaoh's palace in Egypt. No. He was born in a manger. What is a manger? A manger is a feed trough. It's where you put food to feed cattle. I know I'm a farmer. He was born in a manger. He didn't have a wonderful crib or a cradle. He was born in a cave, actually. The hotel didn't even have any room for him. I want to say to you that we, you and I, need to get back to the simple life. Many of us are suffering from stress, from anxiety, and from fear. Because we have got too much, and we can't cope with all of it. And people are stealing it. And the stock exchange is crashing. And all kinds of things are happening in government. And we are having sleepless nights. And half of that stuff, and I'm, so, I'm serious, you'll never use anyway. 
God wants us to get back to the simple life. If you go with me to the Word of God, Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to read two verses, verse 25 and verse 26. It's in the red letter edition. It's Jesus himself speaking. He says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Isn't that, have you ever thought about that? You know that you came into this world with nothing, absolutely nothing. And you're going to go out of this world with nothing, absolutely nothing. Why are we so possessed about owning things that we'll never use? Now, I'm also guilty. I'm a farmer. My boys are farming. We have three farms. My one son's doing strawberries and kiwi fruit. The other son's doing beef cattle and horses. And the other son's doing contracting work. And the other son is doing sugarcane and timber. How much do we actually need? When I think back when I was a young man, when I was farming, I used to worry. I had sleepless nights. That was one of the ways in which the Lord brought me to my knees. I said the Lord, yes. I could never, ever go to sleep. I got so desperate the one time I went to see the doctor, and he gave me some tablets. And I said, what are these? He says, these are to help you sleep. I said, are these tranquilizers? That's what we used to call them in those days. And he said, yes. And straight away, I got a tremendous wake-up call. Because I come from the old school. And I was taught that only women, sorry ladies, no disrespect, only women take these tablets, not men. And I went home and I took them and they never helped me at all. I would go to the pub go to the country club on a Friday night and drink excessively and wake up the next morning with a head this size and the same problems, the same worry, the same fears. It was killing me. And then on the 18th of February, 1979, over 40 years ago, Jill and I went to that little church in the main street in Greytown. And the minister wasn't there. He was there, but he wasn't preaching. And they had a lay witness mission. What's that? Well, that's just ordinary people like you and I. And they were getting up into the pulpit, one after the other, and sharing their stories. I sat there with my mouth wide open. I'd never seen this in my life before. You see, I used to go to church on Christmas Day sometimes. I'd go to Easter sometimes. I'd go to a wedding or a funeral. That was it. And I saw these men and women, businessmen, farmers, sportsmen, accountants, housewives, artists getting up there one after the other, giving their testimony. And the thing that really amazed me is they were weeping. They were crying. They were saying, my marriage was on the rocks. There was no hope for me. I'd been for marriage counseling. There was nothing. And then I met Jesus. And Jesus showed me how selfish I was. And I went and asked my wife to forgive me. And our marriage is Beautiful. My business was going down. I gave it to the Lord. I said, Lord, I can't anymore. And I started sleeping well, started making good decisions, and my business turned around, and today I have many businesses. And this went on and on and on. And then the man at the end, end not the minister, he said, if you are struggling in your life, why don't you come to the front and ask Jesus to take your burdens, cast your burdens unto Jesus. Because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Jill, myself, and my children went to the front. That was the turning point in my life. From that day onwards, I started to live a life of simplicity. If I had a problem, I gave it to Jesus. If my children were sick, I prayed for them. If we had a problem with the weather, I prayed and God brought the rain. People started calling me the rainmaker. <laughs> Can you believe that? 
I'd come to a, a stop street or a robot in town. It had been a dry time and a farmer had come up alongside me, turned his window down. Hey, Angus, ask the man upstairs. He wasn't being disrespectful. He just didn't know what to call God. So sad, eh? Ask him, your friend, the man upstairs, to send us some rain. It's getting a bit dry. I would just smile. I wouldn't rebuke him and say, yeah, no problem. We'd have a prayer day. I'd call for prayer. Not the ministers, me. We'd go to the town hall and some of the saints would bring their umbrellas. That's right. We'd go in. I, this didn't happen once. It happened many times. We'd go into the town hall. We'd pray. Trout time. Walk out. Do, 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 do. Thunder, lightning, down comes the rain. Eh? Oh, Buckham, he, he's the rainmaker. I say, no, I'm not the rainmaker. I'm the rainmaker's son. I'm the son of the rainmaker. And you can be the son of the rainmaker today as well. I want to tell you that God wants us to live a simple life. And through this whole COVID-19 coronavirus time that we've been, we've had lots of time, haven't we? There's been no sport to watch. There's been no clubs that you can attend. Lots of time to think and to pray. I want to tell you from God, and I really mean this from my heart, it is time to simplify your life. All these other gadgets and extras we've got, we don't need them. And that's what's making you tired and weary. You're carrying too much on your shoulders. Give it back to the Lord. Get rid of that excess stuff that you've been promising to do. Do it. And God will change your whole life. Mark chapter 8 verse 36. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? You know how many of us have lost our families for that very reason. Come on now. You know about mighty men. I choose to believe that most of you have been to a mighty men conference somewhere. And you've gone along there, hey? And what's happened? There's come a time when you've had to bow the knee. You've had to confess your sins. You had to admit that it was all about me and my and ek. No good. Me must die so that Christ can live in you. You know what my story was? Absolute truth. Jill would say to me when I came home, I'd come home at night, maybe I'd be working 16 hours a day. That's right. Come home, the kids are already in bed, they're sleeping, they're coming in. And Jill says, where have you been, Angus? The kids haven't seen you. This morning you got up and you went out before they woke up. You're coming back now and they're already sleeping again. Jill, I'm doing this for you. Lies. I'm doing this for you and the kids, Jill, so that you'll have some security. Lies. You know what it was? It was ego. When people drive into my farm, the fences must be straight. Those fence lines must be like uh, guitar strings. The maize crop mustn't have any weeds underneath those maize. Nothing. The cattle must be fat. The tractors must be shiny. The road must be perfect. That's a lot of rubbish, I want to tell you. And you pay a price for that. You don't see your children. But I praise God that I met the Lord. And from that time onwards, spending time first with God, second with my wife, Thirdly, with my children, and then all the rest after that. And I want to speak to a couple of men in the ministry. <clears throat> you say, I'm doing this for the Lord. Be very careful, sir. Because if your son comes to you, I've had it. Young guys have come to me. Why? I say, why aren't you following Jesus? Jesus stole my father away from me. What a horrible indictment. So busy with the work of the Lord that you forget the Lord of the work. What is the point in telling everybody about Jesus and back at the ranch, excuse the pun, the wheels are coming off. We've got to get back to the simplistic life. You know, when I go overseas to preach, and it's just as well, they don't ask me what my theological qualifications are because I don't have any. What they ask me, the first question they ask me is, how's your wife? The wife of your youth. Second question, how are your children? Are they serving the Lord? How are things on the farm? Your staff, what kind of staff turnover do you have? Have you still got staff, the same staff that you started farming with? And then when I can tick those boxes, then they say, right, now speak to us. What is the point of me being a silver-tongued preacher? 
My wife can't put up with me anymore. She's left. My children don't want to know about God. And my farm, because I'm so harsh with my people, it's a big farm. Maybe I've got a number of them. But I've got no permanent staff because they can't put up with me. What, what, what testimony is that for God? And what kind, of, what kind of joy do you get out of that? No, folks. I want to say to you, we need to simplify. We really need to get back to our first love. Get back to basics. That's what one fear for me. You know, the Lord said to me in 2003, I was up at the game reserve up in northern uh, Natal, the Umphalosi game reserve. I was sitting there in the morning having a rest. I was exhausted, preaching nonstop. I was reading my Bible like I always do, systematically, and I got to Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. The Lord says, that he is disappointed in me. You have forsaken your first love, Angus. I'm saying, Lord, I'm doing this for you. I've stopped farming. I've handed the farms over to the boys. I'm you have forsaken your first love. He says, repent, which means stop it. Otherwise, I will take the lampstand from you. What is a lampstand? Light. Who's the light? The Holy Spirit. That's how I interpreted that scripture. What must I do, Lord? You must go home and you must cancel all your preaching appointments. Some of those people had booked me two years in advance. They'd done all the advertising. They'd paid the money. How can I do that? Everything. Number one. And number two, I want you to mentor young men. Finish. That's all. That was it. You know, my oldest son, Andy, always says to me, Dad, I know when you're hearing from God. Because when you call a meeting or you do something that's of God, it works. And when you do something that you think is a good idea, it never works. And it's a fact. And maybe I'm speaking to somebody who's tired of good ideas because they never work, do they? You need to hear from God and you need to simplify your life and simplify your calling. Okay? So what did I do? I came home. The first thing I did, and that was the first miracle, it blew me away. I picked up my phone and I phoned every single one of those appointments. I remember I was going to India. And I was going to Newfoundland. That was two places. I didn't know where Newfoundland was. <laughs> and I wasn't going to India. I still haven't been to India. I'd love to go to India, by the way. But you know, the gospel's gone to India. Do you know that they take this very program I'm preaching now, and they have interpreted it into Hindi. And they've done an excellent job. So I couldn't go physically, but I'm there in the spirit. That's how God works. So what happened? I took uh, my email... I typed out an email, a one-liner, and I said, we are having a Mighty Men Conference, 2004. You are welcome. Now, I knew how to advertise. I'm an evangelist. No advertising. One email, that's all. 240 men arrived. I will never forget it. The next year, 600 arrived. We outgrew the, 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 um, the church. Then we started going to tents. We went from that to 1,000 and I can't remember, 60 I think it was. Then we went to 7,000. Then we went to 60,000. Some of you were there, the biggest tent in the world. 30,000 inside, 30,000 outside. That's right. Then we went open air. Remember, I had the two heart attacks in 2009. That was interesting. And you guys prayed for me and God raised me up. And then 2010, well, some say 400,000 men, some say more. I don't know, I don't know, and it doesn't matter. I want to tell you that a good idea is not always a God idea, and a need does not justify a call. Just do what God tells you to do. Simplify your life, and God will do the rest. You know, one of the saddest stories I've ever read about in my life was a man who was a multi, multi billionaire, not a millionaire. His name was Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes was a very fine, good-looking man. He weighed about 240 pounds. He was married many times to some of the most beautiful actresses in the world. He held the world record for uh, flying an aeroplane at a great speed. He uh, had missiles in his company. He was a, he was a multi, multi-billionaire. He was building missiles, miss missiles in those days. He was only second to the United States government. In fact, they were quite concerned about him. He was so powerful. Howard Hughes. 
And then what happened towards the end of his life? He became a recluse. What's a recluse? He just was on his own all the time. Didn't want anybody around him. He would go to a city and uh, they would book the top floor of a five-star hotel. And he would just live there for as long as he wanted to. He only had assistants around him. He had no friends, nothing. No wives, no children, nothing. They would wear masks. Isn't that amazing? Talking about the coronavirus all the time. Plate glass windows. He was behind there. And he became an absolute eccentric. I'm talking about a man who is so wealthy, I think they still cannot work out how much he's worth. He invented the helicopter, I think, if I'm not mistaken. That man, Howard Hughes, died of malnutrition. You know what malnutrition is? When you haven't got enough food. And yet he could have bought half of America. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? I want to say to you, you need to live the simple life. You need to live the life that Jesus Christ wanted for you. You need to start investing your time in things that will last forever. What are you talking about, Angus? I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about friendships. I'm talking about your wife. I'm talking about your husband. I'm talking about your children. Yeah, but it's too late for me, Angus. It's never too late. We really need to. You came into this world with nothing. I told you that. You're going out with nothing. The only thing that you'll take to heaven with you is souls. You won't take any of that uh, corporation you're building, that empire you're busy building, that reputation you're building, whether it's on the sports field or in the pulpit, by the way. None of that's going to heaven. The only thing you can take to heaven is people. And what is the point in you winning the world and your own children are going to hell? I want to tell you a very, very sad story. There was a famous evangelist by the name of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday literally dried out the USA. He preached against alcohol. They closed down saloons and bars. He was, the most, he was a professional baseball player. He used to run onto the platform and slide into the pulpit. He was an amazing preacher, a great man. But his wife, Ma Sunday, she sat in a restaurant once with Billy Graham and Ruth Graham when they were youngsters. And she said, be careful. Be careful how you live. I've got four sons. And my four sons are in hell today. Because I went with Billy. And we were on the road all the time. What is, what, what is the point? I want to say to you, simplify your life. Spend time with those whom God has given to you. You know, if you have no family, you've got nobody. And I want to say to you, there are many men I know, and I'm determined not to be one of them. They are well known by many people, but they have no friends. You see, you only become a friend when you, have a, when you are a friend. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 4, My sheep shall know me. They shall hear my voice. You know the shepherds in the Middle East, they lead their sheep. The sheep farmers in the West, I've had sheep myself. We chase the sheep from behind with sheepdogs because we don't have time to get to know our sheep. They tell me that in the Middle East, the shepherd will take his sheep down to water them at the pool in midday and he'll meet with all the other shepherds with their flocks and all the sheep will get mixed up together. They'll all be drinking at the pool and the shepherds will sit under the tree and talk about the news of the day. And then when it's time to go, the shepherd will stand up and he'll whistle or he'll shout and his sheep will disentangle themselves from the other sheep and follow the good shepherd. Why? Because they know his voice. How much time are you and I spending with the Good Shepherd? When He calls you, will you hear Him? Will you know His voice when He says it's time to come home? Or will you be busy building your empire on earth where you say, I haven't got time, Lord. And He says, but you're coming. It's time. I want to pray for you. And I want to pray that the Lord will help you to simplify your life during this lockdown time. There's a lot of stuff you don't need. There's a lot of things you have to get rid of. 
so that you can start to concentrate on the things that matter. Please pray this prayer with me as I pray. Pray after me, actually. Dear Lord Jesus, that's right. Today, I repent of not putting you first in my life. Please pray this. I promise today, Lord, to have a good, hard look at myself. And I promise, Lord, to put those things which are irrelevant to eternal life one side. And Lord, it won't be about me anymore. It will be about my loved ones, those that you gave to me. Lord, that I'll spend more time with my employees and less time abusing them in order to make more money. Lord, I promise that I will humble myself and I will get rid of all those excesses that I don't need. I will listen to the words of Jesus. And I will take and use only that which I need. And the rest of the time and the expertise you've given me, I will invest in people because that's the only thing that I'll take to heaven with me. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Ash. It's been wonderful to be with you again. I can't wait for the lockdown to lift and I can come and see you personally and your beautiful congregation. Please give your dear wife my love and your family and keep up the good work and keep surfing for the Lord. <laughs> we love you. Goodbye. I've tried so hard to see it Took me so long to believe it That you choose someone like me Carry your victory Perfection could never earn it You give what you don't deserve it. You take the broken things And raise them to glory You are my champion Giants for when you stand undefeated Every battle you've won I am who you say I am You crown me with confidence I am seated In the heavenly place undefeated With the one who is conquered it all
champion Joy is for when you stand undefeated Every battle you've won I am who you say I am Crown me with confidence I'm seated in the heavenly place Undefeated by the power of your name I am seated in the heavenly place Undefeated with the one that's conquered it all Hey, thanks so much for watching. We trust you enjoyed the message. Make sure you stay connected with us on our social media platforms throughout the week. And we'll see you next week. Cheers.